Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Ben Franklin's World, a podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Each week, we'll sit down with an N historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. I'm really excited about this episode. It's our first episode, and I knew the episode needed to focus on Ben Franklin. I chose him as our show's namesake because he was such a dynamic individual. I mean, Franklin loved to learn, help his fellow man, and he played such an active role in the early American world that this podcast will explore. Now, Knowing that I wanted to begin the podcast with an episode about Franklin, I seized the opportunity I had in July to ask Rich Newman, director of the library company, if I could feature the library company in my first episode. Rich not only enthusiastically agreed, but he asked two of his colleagues, James N. Green and Cornelia King, if they would join me for an interview too. Therefore, we can launch the Ben Franklin's World podcast with a three-part series. In fact, As I'm really excited about this podcast, and as these three episodes provide us with such a fantastic survey of the past, present, and future of the Library Company of Philadelphia, which happens to be the oldest cultural institution in the United States, as well as being Benjamin Franklin's Library, I think think I'm going to call the launch series the Ben Franklin's World Launch Spectacular. What do you think? It may be a bit crazy, but you'll learn that I'm a bit crazy, so I think I'm going to run with it. All right, back to episode one. In this episode, we'll chat with James N. Green, librarian at the Library Company of Philadelphia and co-author of Benjamin Franklin, Writer and Printer. Today's episode is actually the first of our three-part launch spectacular for Ben Franklin's World, so you'll want to make sure that you catch the other two episodes as well. But in this episode, Jim will help us understand what the Library Company of Philadelphia is, the role Benjamin Franklin played in founding the Library Company, and the important role the Library Company has played in colonial, revolutionary, and early Republic America. All right, without further ado, here's my interview with James N. Green. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Joining us, we have James N. Green librarian at the Library Company of Philadelphia. Jim has worked at the Library Company for more than three decades. In addition to writing publications and conference papers to familiarize the scholarly community with the Library Company's holdings, Jim has found time to develop exhibitions for the Library Company and to publish three long essays in the multi-volume series History of the Book in America and co-author Benjamin Franklin, Writer and Printer. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Jim. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And we're delighted to have you. Now, with more than three decades of experience at the library company, it seems like you are the perfect person to tell us what the library company is and how you came to be its librarian. How I came to be its librarian um, is a is a, a story that... <laughs> that um, really says a lot about how this institution has evolved over the years. I'm going to be talking about the library company as it is and the library company as it was um, throughout this um, hour of time together. And I, and I, there, in some ways, there's a lot of continuity, but there are also huge differences. The librarian of the library company, um, going back to our founding in 1731, was um, the, the person who ran the place. And for a long time, the only person who worked in the library was called the librarian. Now we have lots of librarians and other professional staff here. About three quarters of our staff is is professional. And um, so my job um, for a long time, I was just the sort of um, the person who coordinated all the efforts of the librarians and and curatorial and and conservation staff here. Um, And the director, I was called for a while, I was called curator and then I was called assistant librarian. But the director 
remained the librarian until about uh, maybe 10 years ago when our board uh, decided that that wasn't really a very accurate reflection of the way our responsibilities are divided up. And also that the, when the director was going out to raise money and said, um, you know, I'm the librarian, they would say, I want to talk to the director. So they decided to be realistic about it. And now our director is called the director and I'm called the librarian. And that means that represents this difference between the people who are out there in the world trying to drum up support and the person who makes the, the big decisions. That's the director. I'm the person who tries to um, get all of our professional staff um, in in uh, sort of pulling in the same direction and balancing um, the needs of conservation and, uh, and access um, or uh, interpretation that is balancing the need to preserve rare books and manuscripts and graphics against the need to make them as available to the public as they possibly can be. And, um, and also, I, my, one of my uh, sort of special projects going back almost uh, to my, the beginning of my time here 30 years ago was uh, our fellowship program, which is the way that I think we are our strongest tool for building strong relationships with the world of, of the academic world of, of scholarship of historians and uh, people who do historical humanistic studies um, in the time period that the library company serves are extend across the whole range of disciplines. Um, but, but for the most part, um, they're all sort of the, uh, the fellowship program is the sort of umbrella that brings them in and, and that um, interprets the collections to them. So the librarian does a lot of coordination. Um, it historically was the only person who worked for the library company, but obviously that has changed now. Um, mm-hmm. And you, you mentioned that the library gives fellowships for research. Is it just a regular library that has books that people can borrow, or, or what is the institution? What is its purpose? Well, yes, that's, that's probably... I should, have, I should have started by saying that, that, that what the library company is now is an independent research library which serves um, a, a very diverse public, but a, a lot of it is professional or professional becoming professional historians um, or or humanists doing um, historical studies. Um, and so we are a, a library that um, is primarily for research. That means that you come here to read the books. We bring them to you. We don't loan them out. And um, and so they're used under supervision in our in our reading room. Um, and that's, um, that's, I suppose, the definition of a research library is, is one where the collections are very rich and deep, but also um, where, um, you know, the work, the research happens in, in the library for the most part. We also, of course, do as much as we can on the Internet to make our collections available and accessible, but there's really no substitute for um, for sitting down with the, the real things and um, finding what they can teach you. I agree with you there. I always love having the, the touch of the paper and looking at the at the script um, in person versus online. Although when you can't make it to the archive, having it online is, is a nice feature. Um, I actually I actually feel very strongly that the way research the best way to to, to do research now, um, and that's that's not I mean research is is maybe a fancy word for almost any kind of of um, a learning or discovery process that people go through to um, to answer questions or just to enrich their lives. But it's a it's a um, it's a, a process that involve that begins with an interest or curiosity and which takes you into historical sources and that yes you have to combine um, working with online sources with working with with what we sometimes call material texts because there's there's no telling what um, what you're going to learn when you start to investigate you know the actual books that people read and learned from and used as you know, basic tools in their lives in historical times. Yeah, and the library company has really deep collections, and part of that is um, because Benjamin Franklin and his fellow Junto members founded the library company on July 1st, 1731. Um, it is Benjamin Franklin's library, um, and that is the reason we wanted to launch this podcast um, by talking to you. So could you tell us what the Junto was and why Franklin and his colleagues wanted to start a library? Yeah, so now we're shifting gears to um, to the the what we were, what the library company's 
history is. And but I I want to try to as we talk, want to try to show how um, what we are now is very much um, a product of what we were then, as different as that might have been. Oh, that'd be great. Thank so you. So Frank, Franklin, um, so Franklin was a young man when he came to Philadelphia, and he found uh, that it was a city that was um, in some ways. Um, lacking in, in public institutions, and and um, but also one where there was there, was, there were very few books. Um, the, there were some big libraries that belonged to rich men who didn't share them, but um, but there were no there were no public libraries. There was no sort of adult education apparatus and um, opportunities. And one of the one of the first things he did when he uh, came to Philadelphia as a journeyman printer. Was to um, gather around him a, a group of of mostly young men who were um, like him, uh, working with their hands. They called themselves sometimes called themselves leather apron men, which refers to the fact that they were working in trades where um, they had to uh, you know wear wear work clothes to cover their um, their better clothes and w- where they got their hands dirty. So um, and. and the object of their getting together was to it was a kind of mutual support and improvement society, I guess you would say. Um, that um, and, and their their goals were to uh, to sort of band together, to um, work together, to improve their improve their minds, to improve their um, their sort of um, their their ability to uh, converse intelligently and express ideas, you know, all these things that education is supposed to do for people, and um, but also to improve their uh, their communities, uh, their community, and to improve their position in the community. These were three goals, improving your mind, improving your community, improving your position in the community. For them were three, three goals that were completely woven together, could not be teased apart. And, and all of this, though, was based on on um, knowledge, and for them, they although they, I don't think they ever used anyone ever used these words, but they very much it's implicit in everything that they did and their writing and the thinking that lies behind the junto and later the library company is that knowledge is power, and that knowledge can be found in books and and really mainly in books. Obviously, there weren't there weren't all the other sources of information that we have now, and um, so. They they gathered together on Fridays. The Junto did, and uh, a group of about a, a dozen or so men, and they 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 talked about things that mattered to them, about um, about uh, practical knowledge, about how to uh, how community could be, how communities could be improved. And they kept running up against this uh, problem that they didn't have any books. And so one of their activities, they had lots of activities, writing essays about um, you know what good could you do today. Kind of thing, but they they also um, set up a little library where they pooled their individual tiny individual libraries. Sometimes some of the members only had a book or two, but put them all together, and you've got something that is is useful, more useful to the whole than the individual uh, books would be. Well, so this was this worked pretty well, except that people um, wanted their books back some of the time. They actually put them all together in the. In, a, in the, the house of one of the members, and people would meet there, and then they, the, the the collection just sort of like melted away because people wanted their books back, or they took them home and they didn't bring them back. And um, and I think that this was probably uh, um, a lesson that Franklin took very much to heart. That that uh, and, and of course he came from Boston, a place where they had a public library going back into the 17th century, but it wasn't a library. That you could borrow the books from, you couldn't take the books home, and um, and that well, libraries in the past that had been um, uh, that had been set up for sort of community libraries, one sort or another, usually didn't allow people to to borrow. But if they did, they soon regretted it um, because libraries just melted away. So I I think that the the impulse of of setting up the library company was to take this. A little library that the Junto members had formed from their own books and make it a more public institution, but also to set it up on a more formal basis so that, um, and, and the trick would be to come up with some way to to uh, make sure that the library uh, was sustainable, to make sure that people brought the books back, to just put it really simply. Well, this was, um, 
1731, when Franklin, um, you might say, took this library idea public, um, they set up a, um, what, he, what Franklin referred to as a subscription library. And what he meant by that was that um, everybody who wanted to be a member of the library, wanted to participate in the library, would would buy a share for the the initial price was two pounds, which was a, not a outrageous sum of money, but it was it represented a an, an, a, a pretty uh, firm commitment or investment on the part of the people who put down that money. Maybe a week's wages for a working man, something like that, a skilled a skilled worker. So um, so they. they they put down this money. They signed their name. This is the word subscription has to do with signing your name at the at the bottom of a um, what we called the Articles of Association, which set out the sort of rules and bylaws of the of the institution. One of those rules was that um, you were anybody who had a share was was um, welcome to take you know only so many books home, but welcome to borrow so many books at a time and had to return them in a certain period of time. But if they didn't return a book that they had borrowed, then they had to um, pay for a replacement. If they damaged it, they had to pay for its repair. If they just didn't return it at all and didn't make good, they lost their share. Is is this the the origin of of library late fees? uh, It is, very much so, yeah. Um, But it was, we didn't have, we didn't, at the beginning, we didn't have a, the kind of fine system that we have today is just that, that you had to return the book um, or else pay for it. Well, so um, so this was this was a way of making it very much in your interest to return the book. It was not because you know the, the librarian wanted you to return the book. It was because you wanted to return the book so that you wouldn't lose the money that you had had um, in effect already put down by buying a share. Well, so um, so this was. This subscription scheme that Franklin came up with was was had never been tried, so far as I know, in a in a library before, and it was actually it's very hard to find other um, what you might think of as voluntary associations uh, that were set up on this basis before before the library company, and so I think that it was it was it's well known that this was the first subscription library, and in, in, certainly in the British North American colonies and maybe anywhere, but it was also um, it was also it made possible for the first time for a, a community library to be a lending library, and uh, and it also provided a sort of template for um, voluntary associations of all kinds, which later became quite a big thing in America. This is what we, uh, we just the other day had some visitors from um, from Iraq, and, and I was talking about voluntary associations and how many there are in America, and they said, "Yes, it's so amazing how many of these." Um, non-governmental voluntary associations there are in American society. There are a million of them. But this really was the first one. And so they say not only the first, it wasn't the first library, it wasn't the first public library, it wasn't even the first library that lent books, but it was the first one that did, did all those things successfully. But but to give one more thing to, sorry, one more, um, one more sort of, uh, key to this argument about the, the community nature of the library was that after a few years, it seemed to be going so well, um, the, 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 the number of shareholders was increasing, but there was an idea that maybe it was a, a burden to some people to have to buy a share for two pounds in order to become part of this. And so they made it um, so that a, a new bylaw that said that anybody who wasn't a shareholder could still borrow books if they left a deposit with the librarian equal to twice the value of the book. And so here again is the same this financial investment, financial incentive to um, to return books. And it's because of this that, and this is where the, the sort of link to what we are now, um, the, this library really did, um, it did survive. It did hang together. It, it, it didn't lose its books the way other um libraries did at that time. And so today we can be a research library um, mainly because we still have almost all the books we got over our um, um, 200 and almost 300 years of history. And um, and there is no other early American library that has survived to that extent, and certainly none nearly as big as this one. And no other library that is such an accurate um, representation of what 
people were reading in the 18th century. And so that's why people were 19th century. People come here today to study not just the books in the library, but also the book, the culture of books and reading that, um, that was, that existed. It was embodied in this library in in the 18th or 19th century. This is, this is a really great story. Um, and, and it says a lot about our history and you, you know, I can just see how some of our, our libraries today have, um, adapted what Franklin and the Junto did with the library company and improved upon it over the years. Um, and you mentioned, well, yeah, in fact, I would, I would go on to say that, that all public libraries in, in North America up until at least, well, up until the second half of the 19th century were, were subscription libraries like ours. This, this was what public libraries were. The idea that, that a city, um, should, should pay for a public library that, that should be paid for out of tax revenues was um, an idea that hardly even existed before the middle 19th century. And then beginning in about 1850, um, gradually, you know, all the, all the old cities and, the, and, all, and, and all the new cities um, in the United States um, got these tax-supported libraries. And now when we say public library, we mean something a little bit different. By, we mean publicly supported and not just open to the public. But that was a, a much later development. Well, I do have um, at least two follow-up questions on that, and one okay. is um, one is what kinds of books did Franklin um, and the initial members of the of the library company acquire to help them improve, you know, their their artisanal culture, their way, you know, ability to get ahead um, in the early American economy. The, the word they kept using over and over again was useful books, um, and that's. Um, and that means books that that were tools that they could use in their in their daily lives, and that could be on on any subject. But they they were not particularly interested in in learned books or books in foreign languages. They wanted books that told them how to do things. So I guess how to? There used books. to be a bookstore. Yeah, there used to be a bookstore in Philadelphia called the How To Bookstore, which is a great place. Another another sad loss in the world of bookstores. But uh, it's that kind of thing. It was a it was a a place where you could go to find out how to do things or or in this sort of uh improving uh improving your knowledge improving your mind kind of sphere you could say that there were books that that just gave you solid information that you could that you could use so the library and, company not um, a place you'd go for early american novels well no it wasn't as a matter of fact um we had in 17 uh 1770. The last we, we published catalogs of the of our holdings regularly, and in 1770, the last catalog before the Revolutionary War, we had um, I've forgotten exactly. I think it's I think we had three or maybe four novels in the library, and two of them were Don Quixote, um, Don Quixote in Spanish and Don Quixote in English, and also um, Robinson Crusoe was another one. So they were um, there. Are, Fiction was not terribly important in this in this scheme of self improvement. And Robinson Caruso could be looked upon as a as a how to book, you know, how to survive in case you're overtaken by pirates. Well, yeah, absolutely. And it's not just it's not just about how to survive. It's about it's about um, it's a novel about improvement. It's you know this guy this castaway on a, a, what he thought was an uninhabited island um, has a very limited number of tools, and he. And he deploys those in a very intelligent way to um, not just to survive, but to build build a life. Well, that's a little bit like being in the in a colonial city like Philadelphia, where you have very few tools and 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 everything is there that needs to be built. So that's, a, that's an excellent point about um, a useful another another way that books can be useful. And my second follow-up question is, um, it has to deal with the library company's name. You mentioned that um, in order to become a member, you had to pay a subscription fee. Is that why the library company is called the library company and not a library? Because often today when we think of company, we think of a for-profit business. But it doesn't sound like Franklin and his associates wanted to set up a for-profit institution. No, absolutely not. Um, the, you're right. The word company means something very different now. It, it's um, the, it means a corporation, um, I suppose, is, the, is a modern word that, that translates it best. But, but corporations in the 18th century were, were hardly ever uh, profit-making. They're much more likely to be um, the opposite. They were much more likely to be an institution that uh, 
is not making a profit and so be, and, and acting in the public interest and so therefore is entitled to the privileges of a corporation, uh, which is you know, say that the individual members are not liable for the debts of the corporation. That's one of the sort of legal definitions. But um, so it was. So in the 18th century, company meant um, really meant something closer to a voluntary association um, than to, uh, in fact, and, and it's or a voluntary cultural association, a, a nonprofit cultural association. These are these are better ways of of translating company than. And the, the, sh- the language of shares and this kind of thing, too, I mean, all this has been adopted by profit-making corporations, but that that didn't really begin to happen until after the revolution, when the chartering of corporations was one of the powers that the that federal and state governments had for the first time. Now, corporations and, and the wor- really kind of the world of, of literature and books in early America was really the realm of, of white men. Was the library company membership restricted to white men? It, it was in, in um, sort of in, in fact, but not in writing anywhere. Um, it was, there was no expressed um, restriction on uh, membership either by women or by non-white people, but that's the way it was for a long time. And um, the, the, the first women shareholders, first female shareholders at, at the library company came to us by a merger with another similar library that um, that did have several female members. And um, it, it's like the minutes just don't say anything about this. There's no debate about it. There's no even, I think, very serious um, interest in, in this fact. It didn't seem important uh, to our shareholders then that, that there were women among them. And I think it's partly because that there's lots of indications in our in our you know our archives of women borrowing books from the library just using the share of their husbands or their fathers or their brothers. Um, so it was not a not a a place that was all male, but it was a place that was, as far as we can tell, was was all white. And that's that's just a sad fact about um, what libraries. Were what cultural institutions, what any institution was in, in the 18th and 19th centuries. In 1833, there was a um, um, a, a group of African American, free African Americans in Philadelphia, uh, came together and formed the Philadelphia Library Company of Colored Persons. Um, it's an organization about which very little is known. Just the names of some of some of the the members, um, and um, but it was it was a a pretty clear indication of of the the sort of separation of of the races in the 18th and 19th centuries, and also of the but also on the other hand of the of um, a sort of a recognition of the fact that that everybody could benefit from from the kinds of things that a library could do. Interesting. Well, we only have about five minutes left, but during that time, um, I wonder if you could talk a bit more about. Um, any contributions that Benjamin Franklin made specifically? I mean, he made his livelihood as a printer. So did he print any books for the library company or sell any of his works to the library company? Um, you know, a minute ago you asked about what, how to characterize the books the library company uh, got. And there's another, another common fact uh, about them all. They were all imported from England. This was not a library of American books. This was a library of books from the, you know, the, the imperial uh, capital, and it was very much a matter of diffusing um, the books of the of the center into the colonial periphery. Well, so um, and that's you know I, there were there were very few books in Philadelphia when Franklin started the library company. Um, there were partly um, it was really almost I would say more as a as a bookseller than as a printer that Franklin um, uh, sort of built up the. The, a, a trade in books in Philadelphia. He he printed a lot of he printed newspapers. He printed almanacs. Um, he was the printer to the library company, so he printed our um, our little blank forms that you filled out when you bought a share. He, he printed our catalogs, but Franklin printed very few books. And but what he did as a bookseller was import books from England more probably than anybody else in the colonies. So by um, the 1760s, when Franklin retired from business as a printer, his bookstore was the biggest in British North America, and oh. 
Philadelphia had become a place that was rich in books. And of course, the the, the knowledge that he gained from being a librarian made him a better better able to run a good bookstore, and and vice versa. And books, of course, help make Philadelphia feel even more cosmopolitan uh, in the colonial well, sense. Yes. Yes, in, in fact, in Franklin's autobiography, he says that, um, which is written in, at least part of it anyway, written um, before the revolution, in, in about in, uh, just before the revolution, he said that that um, that there were now subscription libraries like the library company all over the colonies. He called the library company the mother of all the North American subscription libraries, now so numerous. And he said it was because of these libraries that um, he believed that Americans had been so... Um, both resolute and articulate, and also united in the stand they had taken uh, against um, the British. And and he said, in another place, he said that that because of these libraries, Americans are now more um, uh, are more knowledgeable. Uh, an American tradesman is more knowledgeable than a, a, a titled gentleman in England. And I think that says a lot for um, his his view of what this li- what the library company did was his claims for the importance of not only this library but the libraries that were patterned after it. His claims were were huge. He must have been. It sounds like he was really proud of of his accomplishment in finding the library company. He was, although you know, it's typical of Franklin that he never wanted to be uh, called the founder. He always said that he was one of a group of of men um, that came together to form the library and never that he was the founder but we know in fact that he was he was the the guy that you know came up with all the ideas and organized everybody but this is this is one of his principles how to start a voluntary association don't make it all about you <laughs> interesting now you mentioned that the the library company imported books franklin imported books from england now what happens when england comes to philadelphia in september 1777 the British General William Howe and his soldiers capture Philadelphia from the Patriots. So did they use the library company while they occupied Philadelphia? They, hard, they hardly used it at all. And I think the reason for that is at that time, library, the library company was in, on the second floor of a building called Carpenter's, Carpenter's Hall. And this, was another, this was another company, actually. The Carpenter's Company was, the, was a sort of, of um, association of, of builders and um, you know, people who built houses, and um, and the the first floor of this hall was put into use by the British as a hospital almost as soon as they occupied Philadelphia, and that meant that you couldn't get upstairs to the second floor. The library company was on the second floor. You couldn't get upstairs through the hospital to use the library. So we basically closed it, and um, and there was even a notice that we sent out that said members who want books from the library will have to get them at the librarian's house. Hmm. So this was, um, you know, a sort of blessing in disguise that sure. um, there was no, there was no, um, uh, you know, no looting, <laughs> no, um, no loss of books at all, as far as we can figure. But during that, th- during the months that Philadelphia was occupied, the libraries functioned at a very minimal level. I have to say, everybody was pretty distracted by everything else that was going on. Yeah, I can't imagine why they were distracted. <laughs> so <laughs> many, so many things going on. Um, but that actually, your story of Carpenter's Hall brings me into my my last question, which is: I've heard that the library company has been referred to as the de facto library of Congress, and I wonder if this is a true statement, and if so, how did or does the library company of Philadelphia serve Congress? It is a true statement, and um, but it, it's it's based on on this simple fact that during the period when the, the Continental Congress was meeting in Philadelphia, we invited the delegates to um, use the library without having to buy shares. And um, we do, there's, there's some indication of, of what use the delegates to the Continental Congress made, but, but we didn't keep circulation records. You know, when you returned a book, the little slip of paper that said you had it out was handed back to you as a receipt. So we had self-destructing circulation records. So it's really sad that we can't say anything about almost all, we can say almost nothing about who used the library or what they read. But, um, and then during the, um, after the war, the, during the time of the constitutional convention, we did the same thing. And, um, and then when Congress, when the government moved to Philadelphia in 1790, we did the same thing again. So, 
Uh, it was only when the when the government moved to Washington in 1800 that um, they decided they needed to start a library, and it became and 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 it really the idea of the library being not a national library but a congressional library is 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 a just a extension of what we did with with Congress during um, during the founding period. So um, so yes, we were the we were in effect the Library of Congress, and um, but but it, that's also I think a very good way of summing up what um, what's important about about our collections too, because um, we sometimes refer to ourselves, at least in our 18th century existence, as as the delegates' library. It was it was the library that was um, the the biggest library that was available to the founders. The biggest public library in North America, but it was also the one that um, that really had everything that um, about um, you know it had it had every important book about politics, about public affairs, about history, about philosophy. Um, every book that the founders ever mentioned or referred to was here um, in in the 18th century. Wow, this has been a great conversation. I've learned so much about the library company. Um, I'm now itching to get in there to do some research. Um, But we like to respect our guests' time, and ours has come to an end. Um, But just before we go, could you tell us where we should look if we ever want to find out more information about the Library Company of Philadelphia, its history, and its holdings? You will find all of that on our website at um, librarycompany.org. That's Library. Those words, library company, are all spelled out. Um, no abbreviations or dots or dashes. And um, and on the website, you'll find um, a, a history of the library company. That is um, actually a, a a book that we've just posted there um, called "At the Instance of Benjamin Franklin." We have our online catalog, which has um, gives uh, catalog records for almost everything that we have and. Uh, at least all of our rare books, and then um, and also um, a lot of information about what our activities are, and exhibitions, and programs, and podcasts, and and things like that. Um, also, instructions on how to apply for a fellowship, and um, and lengthy descriptions about our various collection strengths. It's all on the website. Fantastic, and I'll be sure to include a link uh, in our show notes for this episode. Well, thank you so much for your time, Jim. We really appreciated it. Well, it it has been a pleasure, and you know I love telling the story, and um, and I I um, as I as I I think I began by saying that that the history of the library company is um, is really you you can't really understand what we do today or what we're good for today unless you understand at least the basics about about how we came to be because libraries are like that they're about building up uh, collections that then last hopefully forever and or at least long enough to to be ever continually used in different ways and and used in in more ways than they were ever originally um the books that were used in, in different ways than they were originally um uh, thought of that's that's one of the great strengths of a historical collection like this and yours has been around for 283 years so i was groping for that number before yes 283 Right. That's our that's our age. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Maybe we'll be able to have you on the show again in the future, and you can tell us a lot more about the library company. Well, I would appreciate that opportunity, and thanks thanks for um, thanks for listening. Wow, I could talk to Jim for hours. He is so knowledgeable about the library company and other aspects of early American history. I was fascinated to learn that the library company has influenced how our modern public libraries operate today. You? I also enjoyed learning about how practical Franklin and his fellow tradesmen were. I love to learn how to do things, so a whole library filled with how-to and practical books seems like a dream. Now, you can find information about Jim, the library company, and everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode, which you'll find at benfranklinsworld.com slash 001. Now, please remember that although our conversation with Jim has ended, Our discussion about the Library Company of Philadelphia has just begun. There are two more episodes in our Ben Franklin's World Launch Spectacular. Episode two features an interview with Cornelia King. 
Chief of Reference at the Library Company. And Connie's going to chat with us about how the Library Company hosts its history exhibitions. And in Episode 3, we'll speak with Richard S. Newman, Director at the Library Company of Philadelphia. In Episode 3, Rich shares information about the past and present efforts of the Library Company to serve the public at large. And as the library company has existed for over 283 years, this is a very interesting conversation. If you enjoyed today's episode, please tell your friends about us. We won't be listed on iTunes or Stitcher until December, so please send them to benfranklinsworld.com so they can discover more about our show and download all the episodes. And finally, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions about the show or what I can do to improve it, please let me know. Send me an email to liz at benfranklinsworld.com or tweet me at Liz Kovar. I really want this show to be great, so whatever you think I can do to improve it, I'm willing to try. Well, thank you for joining me. So please check out episode two, and we'll chat with Connie King. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today. <laughs>